Daktari Dr. KN Jacob Karibu sana daktari Woo 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 Welcome sir Karibu sana Uh, I'm wondering whether I should have gone to Atlanta or Alabama. There is so much fun here. And I'm sensing God. The Bible says where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. It's my first time to meet Pastor Jacob. I'm so honored. And uh, chaplain, pastor, man of God, thank you so much. Even Jeremy, I'm meeting him for the very first time today. And I'm so grateful. And uh, Peter and Purity, we were together in college, so we have known each other for many, many years. And uh, yeah, he's my senior brother. And uh, would you want Masi to say hi? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that is how he catches me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening ladies and gentlemen, oh my God, I think uh, we are so honored this evening to be together with you. Jeremy, thank you so much for inviting us. I mean, it's not every day you get into a venue like this, you get free lunch, or free dinner, and dance, and, stress, and get all your stresses out, isn't it? So really, we are grateful, Jeremy, for, this, for organizing this. We are, I am having fun. I don't know about everyone else, but I'm totally having fun in this environment. So thank you so much. So um, this guy you see here actually declared me his wife when I was only 19 years old. I was only 19, and it's been 21 years in just about three weeks since we got married. <laughs> and all I can say is that it's not... Easy, yeah. You know, many people probably see us out there and think, oh my God, it's all rosy, it's all flowery. Oh no, it's just by the grace of God. We can't just stand here and say, oh, it is, we have made it. It is by our own strength or by our own whatever. But it is by the grace of God. He has blessed us, he's favored us in a very special way. And we believe it's for the sake of the kingdom. So that as you have all said that, uh, so that we can be a testimony like the song we have just sung here for very many families in this world to encourage them, to strengthen them, and to live a day at a time thanking God for the gift of family. We have been blessed with two children, Ivy and Zig, whom we deeply love, and they sent their greetings to you all. So the Lord bless you, and let's continue having fun. Actually, I have never said this in public. We were preaching in Cabalnet, and I was a preacher that day. And that evening, I asked Marse for a date. We were not friends, to be honest. We were, we, were, we were in the same college, but we were not friends. I knew her, and uh, I visited her twice in her room. And uh, I behaved like I had an agenda, but I never told her. <laughs> so when we went for this mission, I was the missions coordinator in our university. We were in Jaycourt. So when we were in this particular mission, after preaching, I asked her whether we could go and do dinner together. And I actually told her, you're going to be my wife. I didn't give her a choice. <laughs> and uh, we dated for four and a half years. And finally, she gave me this ring, 203, uh, March 29th. So actually, in two weeks, we will be 21 years married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We thank God. <laughs> Allow me to say this. Uh, um, when I actually my area again I had to talk about this in public my area is project management and when I'm teaching project management I teach authoritatively when I'm teaching about marriage I teach with a lot of caution in a live audience and I think I want to add just what Marcel was saying it's just by the grace of God so let me make a clear disclaimer here I am not bringing expert advice, no. I want to be a facilitator. You all have different experiences about your marriage. We are here to share. My personal conviction is that marriage is both an art and a science. A science means there are universal procedures, principles, laws that work. There are certain business principles, a social entrepreneur like him, they work the world over. But there is another aspect of business, and there is another aspect of marriage, which is art. 
in marriage, it also involves ingenuity, creativity, innovativeness, because we are also different individuals. But there are some things we will debate, negotiate, and also agree to disagree. And don't feel bad to disagree with me. This, when you go to church tomorrow, where Pastor Jacob is pre preaching and the other ministers here, that's a different platform. In this platform, feel free to disagree with me. I'll be giving you a chance for Q&A. Do not try to buy everything I say. The only thing we will not debate is where we are quoting scriptures. But how I implement that in my house might be very different from how you implement that in your house. Does that make sense? And uh, what is also amazing, many of you here have been married for many years, and I believe they are also young couples. I'm not talking about age. How many here are 10 years and below in marriage? 10 years and below. Just, okay. They look like they're the, oh, let's appreciate them. I think before I say what brought me here tonight, I want to just tell those couples who are 10 years and below, you're here. Everybody's telling you they're 15, they're 20, they're blah, 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 blah. But I think what you should pick from all this is that you're also going to make it. If somebody is 24 years married like him, and that's what Pastor Jacob was saying. He said something very powerful. You're always hearing the news of one aeroplane that crashed, but thousands are landing safely, and nobody's telling you. So I think, don't be intimidated by, the, the reason we are married for more years is simply because we are older, that's all. It's, it's not because we know more. Does that make sense? So you're going to make it. And uh, we are living testament, and others who are like, we are 21, but my friend Peter is 24, but he also left college before me, he meant purity. So they are, only that they are also slightly older than me. That's it. Does that make sense? Yeah, so let's debate, we, and that's why I want to spare time. I was telling Jeremy, when we are doing marriage seminars, in my considered opinion, the most important time is Q&A, where people now become very specific. Now, all the speakers who came before me, especially the pastors, emphasized about the foundation of marriage. And I, and I like the way he put it, because he, he made it clear, then if you have strong families, you have strong churches, a stronger society, and a stronger nation. The question, however, we don't ask ourselves many times, then how do we end up with strong families? What are these things we call marriage foundations? Again, I say for the last time, this is not expert advice, but I'll share with you three pillars, which in my view are the marriage foundations. There may be many, and I documented them in one of my books. I call it The Three Secrets of my marriage, and I want to share with you these three things. Now, some of the things I'm going to say will offend you, uh, just to say in advance, nothing personal. As I said, I have, I honestly don't know you at a personal level, apart from Peter and purity. If you feel like I'm stepping on your toes, I'll try my level best, do with a lot of love. <laughs> and uh, the Bible is not just there to encourage us, Pastor Jacob will agree with me, but it's also there to rebuke us and to correct us. But sometimes the things spoken here are not meant for you. They are meant for you to go and share with other people. Because most of the people who struggle with marriages don't even come for marriage seminars. So you are here also as God's ambassador and representative to go and influence other families out there. Does that make sense? So you might listen to something that may benefit others. So what I think are the most critical things in marriage and I have one privilege, maybe the only privilege I have, more than many of you, is that every week I interact with at least 10 couples from different corners of the world. People engage me from different corners of the world. Uh, and I literally mean that, in excess of 100 countries. So I have had that privilege, a platform given by God to interact with different people. And that's why I compiled this little book. So I think the things, in my view, are very critical, are the things that you know, but maybe you don't think about them seriously. So I want us to think about them seriously today. Leadership, sex, and communication. And especially number two, it's very taboo in Africa to talk about sex. So if you're uncomfortable, let me encourage you to leave before I proceed. <laughs> because I will get extremely raw. Uh, the first thing is leadership. 
And I want to ask you a question before you answer, because I need you to give me your honest opinion before you answer. This is the question I'll be asking you in marriage, the back stops with who, before you answer. Let me explain the question. Some of us believe in marriage, the back stops with the man. Some of us believe in marriage, the back stops with the woman. And they can pull enough scriptures from the book of Proverbs, how a wise woman builds her home, and a bad woman tears her home with her own hands. In fact, the Bible says that. And some of us here believe it's 50-50. The man has 50% responsibility, and the woman has 50% responsibility. So I want you to be vulnerable. Let us be vulnerable with each other. So I'll, be ask, I'll ask you now a question, just by a show of heart. Agree to be vulnerable, so that we learn. So how many here believe the buck stops with the man? Hearts up. Okay, hearts down. How many here believe the buck stops with the woman? Okay, at least you have one heart. How many here believe it's 50-50 in marriage? Of course, the majority. That's where the problem begins. I'll tell you this. Let me first make it clear. I believe the buck stops with the man, and I'm going to show you in scriptures. But before we get into scriptures, let's just reason. Let's just reason together. And uh, where I don't tell you the truth, don't agree with me. When a company thrives, le let me give you three examples. Who is the brain behind Microsoft? Okay, Bill Gates. Who is the brain behind Tesla? Elon Musk. Who is the brain behind Facebook? Are there other people who work for Facebook? But they don't get the credit. People have come and left, but there is a constant, Mark Zuckerberg. When a company thrives, we give credit to the CEO. And we know it's true for countries. We know today, Qatar is not doing better than Kenya because of oil. Nigeria has more oil than any country in the Middle East except Saudi Arabia. DLC has more resources than perhaps the seven richest Arab countries combined. And I'm talking about natural resources. So we know one major reason why so many Kenyans are in Alabama or Georgia, but you're not going to find anyone from Emirates working in America. You'll find people from Mexico, from Vietnam, from Romania, from Uganda, from Nigeria. You won't find one. Have you, have you met somebody here in Birmingham, an Emirati, a born Emirati working here? What's the difference? It's leadership. It's not resources. It's leadership. We are here primarily. Yes, there is another aspect which is divine, like the gospel. But we do know that a lot of money in Kenya, every single regime has been stolen. Every single regime. And Kenyans don't even understand the extent of corruption. That's a talk for another day. So it's about leadership. So we agree the making or breaking of a nation, the buck stops with the president or the king, or whoever is the supreme leader. In a company, the buck stops with the CEO. In a church, the buck stops with the pastor, a pastor like him or him. If the church collapses and he tells God, you know, you gave me sick congregation, then he's not worth the calling because God never promised him stable people in the church. Actually, he was promised sick people to come to church. It's a hospital. So, Pastor, when you feel these people are too sick, that was the assignment. The buck stops with you in that congregation. When it comes to family, that's the only place we argue. And some CEOs say the same thing. The company collapses, it's the board. It's the employees. But when the company is driving, then it is the CEO. If the buck stops with the pastor in church, if the buck stops with the CEO in a company, if the buck stops with the president or the king or whoever in a nation, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, from common sense, if the man is the leader of a family, then the buck stops with the man. Now, is this biblical? Yes. Let's check how Jesus looked at it. He said, I will build my church. I will never blame the devil. The verse continues, and the gates 
of heads shall not prevail against it. I am responsible. The buck stops with me. It doesn't stop with Peter or Paul or John or Jacob. The buck stops with me. And the Bible compares the church with the bride, the wife of Christ. I will build my, I'm responsible for my marriage. So Jesus made a commitment. The church will never fail. And that's how, if you're here panicking because of homosexuality in America, let me tell you, relax. The church will never fail. Yeah, the church has gone through, you know, we ha, yeah, we have false prophets. We have many challenges in the church. But the church has gone through a lot of ups and downs. But the church will never fail. God will always have a remnant. Jesus took full responsibility for his marriage. He said the back stops here. And then he says, husbands, love your wives as I have loved my wife. I've set you an example. The back stops either with somebody or it stops nowhere. So the moment we start saying 50-50, that's where we start losing it. And it's not biblical. And it's not, it doesn't even work in the corporate world. Here in the U.S., for example, during the Gulf War, the Congress refused to sign that war. It was senseless. There's nothing America was getting out of it. But the president has veto powers. That's why Trump had said, whether the Congress agrees to build the wall or not, I'll go ahead and do. I have other sources of funds, like the contingency funding. Why? He has what we call executive powers. If you follow what is going on in Kenya, that's the same language basically Ruto is using when he's saying he's going to send soldiers to AET. He, If you're listening to his tone, if parliament approves, it's okay. If not, it doesn't matter. I'm sending soldiers to AET. Why? He understands he's the commander-in-chief. We may disagree with his policies. I'm not saying whether it's good or not. I'm not into politics. I hope... I hope we are together. It's just an example. So what I'm saying is this. At the end of the day, the back either stops somewhere or it doesn't stop anywhere. It doesn't stop anywhere. And the Lord took total responsibility for his marriage. And the reason I'm using that term, marriage, is because throughout scriptures, our own marriages are always, the Lord uses them as a mirror of the real marriage between the real bridegroom Christ and his bride, because our marriages here are temporal. The one Jesus is talking about is eternal. And that's the model he wants us to copy. Back to the creation of man. And Peter, of course, says, your wife is a weaker partner. He uses the word the weaker verse, so it doesn't mean she's weaker. He's just bringing the aspect that there's a leader. In fact, Paul makes it clear the husband is the head of the family. I mean, throughout scriptures, and even here, nobody's in debate that the man is the head. The problem comes when we say, where does the back stop? Then the head suddenly says, we need to discuss whether the back stops with the head or with the neck. Why? Because when a marriage fails, nobody wants to be associated with failure. It's the same thing with business. People fail in business, that's the time they talk about, you know, the government of Kenya. You know the taxes. You know Kajo. Who told you to start the business? Did Kajo tell you to start? Did you not know there is such a kaju? Just think about it. But if the business succeeded, nobody will come and tell you because of the support of the government. <laughs> when it succeeds, they want to show you how smart they are. When it fails, the economy, the dollar rate, the government, you know, they keep on coming for closing our shops. The old people pull excuses when they don't succeed. I've never met one couple that divorced, and somebody said, I was responsible. Every time when a couple goes through the divorce, it's always the other party. So either the back stops with an individual or the back stops nowhere. Now, let's go back to the beginning of marriage. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and uh, take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I only needed you to see two points. The helper comes in verse 18. Before Eve comes onto the scene, God has given Adam two things. Number one, work. And number two, he gave him the command. 
So we keep on saying how Eve ate the fruit. Eve was not there when this command was given. It was Adam's responsibility to teach Eve the word of God. It is very clear. Just think about this. In your places of work, if somebody has been working in a place five years before you, when you go there, they start showing you the ropes. They show you how to do things, irrespective of which job you do. When somebody comes there and they are new in that job, just by the virtue you are there before them, whether you're in the hospital, whether you're in trucking, whatever business you're doing, the fact that you are there three years, four years, five years, ten years ahead of them, you are the one to show them. And that's what God expected. He expected Adam to teach Eve the word of God. Number two, we don't see God giving Eve work. He gave Adam the work. He said, all oh, the work is yours. But I'm giving you someone to help you. So you're responsible for doing the dishes at home, for doing the laundry, for fixing the dinner. If she fixes, no entitlement. Because she's just helping. You understand the work was yours from the word go. When we get this principle, we don't feel entitled. Actually, as a matter of fact, if you find she has done laundry or she has made the bed, you should be very shocked how she has really helped. Because from the word go, she was not there even when the work was given. And this sounds funny, but throughout the ministry of Jesus, that's how he operated. That's how he operated. He came to serve the disciples. Now, of course, we have different definitions of leadership, and I know most of you here are students of people like John Maxwell. And uh, he has his own definition. Let me give you my personal definition. I honestly think leadership are three things. This is my personal definition. Initiative, influence, and service. And, and I, do, I know John Maxwell uh, emphasizes influence uh, and based on his personal experience. My personal experience, this is how I look at leadership. And I want us to break it down because I may say that the buck stops with the man. The man is the leader. And of course, the question in your mind then, what is leadership? So what is the man supposed to do? So let's break it down. Uh, number one, I believe a leader is the one who takes initiative. Now, I'm going to mention five things. They don't present every family here, but it's just an illustration of what initiative means. So I'll give five items, and then I'm going to give you a challenge. Uh, who initiates sex in your marriage? And I'm not saying a woman can't, but I'm saying usually. Usually, because sometimes she might be feeling very hot, you know. But usually, on a typical day, who initiates conflict resolution? When there is a problem and you can't talk to each other, who says, honey, let's talk? Let's talk. I think we don't need to carry this thing. Or who is there keeping quiet, waiting to be pampered and the ego to be massaged? Who says, yes, let's go down, let's solve this problem? Who remembers that the family needs to go for holiday? We need to relax. Who initiated your house buying or like uh, Maridadi presented a project here? Who is going to tell the other one, hey, why can't we go and buy our young brother a car to do Uber? He gave us a procedure. Or maybe dad, why can't we surprise our dad with a pickup for him to do tomato farming better? Who is that? And finally, who looked for your children's school where they go to school? Who attends the parents' meetings? where your child goes to school. And, 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 and as I'm saying, from a research perspective, this does not mean these five items present initiative. But time can't allow us to go through that items, or 40 or 50. That would have been more representative. But using just this fairly, just to drive the point home, out of these five points, don't talk to your partner. How many would you give yourself? Don't talk to your partner. Just think through it. Out of these five, which I'm using just as an example, would you give yourself a two, a three, a four? What I'm saying is this. The person who has three or more items is generally the one who takes initiative at home. And the person who takes initiative is the leader. The leader does not wait to be told that the dishes need to be cleaned. The leader does not wait to be told that the grass needs to be mourned. The leader does not need to be told 
that the rent or the mortgage needs to be paid. The leader takes initiative because the leader cannot stand seeing new people being auctioned or being kicked out of that house or the car reclaimed by the lender. The leader cannot wait until things go haywire. So don't talk to your partner on this. Just think about it. Soul search and ask yourself in your home. And I say it, these five items might not present your family, but there are many other items that present your marriage. The question is, who takes initiative? That's the leader. Number two, who influences values in your family? Again, I give five examples as an illustration. Who sets the best moral example? If you were to be honest here, who has not been in you in your marriage? Who has not been accused of cheating? Who is always caught flirting and trying to explain you are just talking? There's nothing going on. You have to keep defending yourself all the time. There's nothing going on. <laughs> then the person who doesn't have to defend anything is the one who is setting the morals in that family. Who really loses their cool? And who is always behaving like a Meru or a Kisi? No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm just checking whether you're alert, guys. Hey, I'm just checking whether you're alert. Who really loses their cool? Okay, let me say this. Like Kamkaba, composed. Like Kalonzo. Who, <laughs> who is the breadwinner? Now, let me make a disclaimer here. From my considered opinion, from the bottom of my heart, I really don't care who earns more. And I don't think that bothers God either. But there is a problem. If the man sits at home, waits for the wife to go there, hustle, come fix dinner, there's a problem. So, so what I'm saying is this. Let me just pick some hypothetical figures. Let's say here we have a gentleman who earns 3K and the wife earns 5K. There is no problem. Seriously speaking, the guy is hustling because, let's be frank, at this time of age, you cannot predict with any precision who is going to earn more. This is not like when we were growing up. The, the chances between a man and a woman in the marketplace are fairly equal. So any of you can make more money than the other, and there's no issue with that. But I have a problem with any man who sits at home watching TV, scrolling through their phone, waiting for the wife to take care of the bills. I have a problem with that. At least, even in Kenya, we say, he should be doing something. And I tell you, even God has a problem with you sitting at home, waiting for your wife to earn. Yeah, First Timothy 5, 8 says, you're worse than an infidel, and you have denied the faith. Who leads prayers at home? And I know this one, a lot of African men fail the test. The average Muslim leads, his prayer, leads prayers at home five times a day. The average Jew leads prayers at home three times a day. The average Christian man from Muranga. <laughs> Mama obea chakula. <laughs> Again, the word Muranga there is just a stereotype. Don't take it seriously. It doesn't mean anything. But the point is this, I, I know we call ourselves Christians, but when we check the practice, if you check what a Muslim means at his home, and that's why even when you're trying to share the gospel with these people, it is very hard to get them out of their faith because of the indoctrination they go through. The only people who are shaky in their faith is Christians. Why? The moment a father doesn't believe in God, children don't believe in God. Believing in God is not calling yourself a Christian. It is your children seeing you on your knees praying. That's how they see their Muslim father doing. That's how they see their Jewish father doing. We are the only people who don't believe in our faith. When my kids were not born, I would go touch masses, bless them when they were in the stomach. When they were little, they couldn't follow our prayers. I would go kneel on their bedside, pray with them even pray in tongues, speak and prophesy over them. And when they became bigger, they know that we cannot sleep without reading scriptures. One chapter, we read together, we get on our knees, we pray always on our knees. That's how they have known me. They know that I believe what I preach and what I teach. When they see the father practice that faith, that faith becomes permanent in these kids. 
Some of us, the reason right now we are firefighting, trusting God that our kids will come back to church, is because in the first place, they never saw you believing in the God you're talking about. They never saw you believing in that. And that's the question I'm asking. Who is this literary who takes these kids to Sunday school and who reminds them to pray and to read the scriptures? And finally, who checks their homework? And this, remember all, this, all these challenges I'm setting to men because we have a tendency of thinking once you provide, financially speaking, then you have done your responsibility, which means you have reduced yourself from a husband and a father to a sponsor in that family, to a Red Cross. You have reduced yourself to AMREF, to World Food Program. When God gave you a higher mandate to be a father, to be a husband, to be a leader, to shape their morals. Again, these five items may not be representative of what our families, but I would like you to mark for yourselves, out of five, how many do you give yourself? And if your wife has three out of five, and then we go back to where we were earlier, your wife again here has three out of five, you call yourself a leader, but she's actually leading that family. Because leadership is not saying I'm the man. Uh -uh. Leaders don't need to say. You don't need to tell anybody you're the leader. You lead. If you go to the park, animals don't confuse. There's the animal that leads the park, and he doesn't go shouting. He simply leads. In leadership, you don't keep defending your position. If you find yourself explaining to your wife, you know I'm the leader. You should be submitting to me. You have a problem. <laughs> you have a problem. If you hear a president who is explaining I'm the president, he should get out of that position. <laughs> or a pastor telling people, tell me again, you know I'm the pastor here. I think you're the only one doubting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Finally, leadership is service. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is the man who should be massaging the girl. <laughs> By the way, I tell you with a lot of humility, occasionally Massey will massage me, but most of the time, I am the one who massages her. And that's the truth God knows. Because leaders don't wait to be served. Leaders serve. Let's hear what Jesus said, the ultimate leader. These are the words of Christ. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and right to so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Not if you teach them. If you do them. If you do them. Can you imagine the Lord of glory? By whom the heavens and the earth were created. Looking at 12 men who had dirty feet. They were wearing open shoes and stepping down to wash them. Not because he needed to, but to set an example for me as a man. To set an example for anyone who calls themselves leader. Jesus was preparing these guys for what we call the apostolic ministry. He had so many disciples. But of all the disciples, Jesus said, only these 12 were later designated apostles. And any pastor in this place will tell you the highest ministry in the Christian church is the apostolic ministry. Is the apostolic ministry. So when he was doing this to them, that's what he was preparing them for. He's telling them, in this kingdom, things don't work like out there. It is you to serve the others. Don't wait to be served. It is your job to serve. And now I'm saying this, the Christian marriage, this is Jesus demonstrating the Christian marriage between him and the bride. It is you calling yourself the leader to serve your wife everywhere. From the sitting room to the kitchen to the bedroom. More about that. But it's your job to serve. Of course, this is the oldest debate in history. If the woman doesn't feel loved, then she doesn't respect him. If he doesn't feel respected, then... He doesn't love her. So again, I want us to do a fair game, and I want you to be honest. Don't, don't do something for politics tonight. 
So, here are two arguments. The wife should submit for the husband to love, or the husband should love for the wife to submit. How many here believe love comes first? The husband should love for the wife to submit. How many believe that? Hats up. All right, hats down. How many believe the woman needs to submit, or rather to respect, for the husband to love? <laughs> <laughs> She submits first. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? I say let's be vulnerable, isn't it? Yeah. 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 He's been real. He's vulnerable. And that's what I'm looking for. And he lifted, he, 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 the way he lifted you, none of us, the whole place has done that today. Yeah? Because she submits. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have one candidate. Who else believes? The woman should submit first. Today the votes are not so many on your side. <laughs> oh, we have another one. Yeah. You know, you know why I wanted us to be honorable, uh, very vulnerable? So that we can learn together. And so I'm going to give the two of you a different view. And as I said, this is a marriage seminar. You don't have to agree. I honestly agree with the rest here, not the two of you, for two reasons. One reason is because love is greater than submission. In fact, it is the only virtue in the Bible equated to God. The Bible says, for God is love. 1 John 4, 8. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, love is greater. Now, in fact, there were like six, 13 commandments in the Old Testament, and then the 10, and then the 2, and then the 1. So Jesus talked about the two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, might, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yes. yourself. Then he gave one commandment. In fact, I know this may sound radical to tell you today, if you fulfill the one commandment Jesus gave, you don't need to bother with any other commandment. That sounds radical, so let me repeat and explain. If you do the one commandment, he finished by saying, okay, 6, 13, 10, 2, then 1. This is my commandment, that you love. And truth of the matter is, if you can do that commandment, that's the only commandment in grace. All the others are the law. You don't need to bother with anything else. Why? Because if you love your neighbor, you can't sleep with your wife. If you love your neighbor, you can't steal from them. If you love your neighbor, you can't covet their car. If you love your neighbor, you can't murder them. There will be no Ukraine-Russian war today or the Israel-Palestinian war, if there was love. All the problem you are seeing in the world today is because of failing in that one commandment. That's basically what Jesus summarized. So love is greater than anything else. And Paul talks about that in First Corinthians 13. He says the greatest of them all is love. So, but more importantly, is go back to the story of Christ. And that's what I want you to realize. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, this is more important for you to, to follow. Follow this if you can. The Bible says, you did not love me, but I loved you. And Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. So let me ask you guys what started? The love of God or the submission by the church? The love of God. The love of God preceded. So the church responds in submission. So this is not a cycle as has been drawn by many psychology books. When it comes to scriptures, this circle that has been talked about for so long, it does not exist. Because there's no such a circle. These are books of psychology, not scriptures. Love is greater. Love is God. Love precedes. Submission is a response to love. That's the word of God. It's a response. One day I was doing such a seminar, and a gentleman challenged me at the end of the presentation. He said, you know, we have people in church who don't submit to Christ despite the love of Christ. Because in that particular place I said, you can't love your wife as Christ loved the church and she fails to submit. And that's my start. You can love her 
according to God's definition of love, and she has any other response. So a gentleman challenged me. There are some people who don't submit despite how you love them. That's not true. First, let me say this. If somebody does not submit to Christ, hear me out. He's not part of the church of Christ. He's not. Don't ever be fooled. If anybody is in the church, they submit to Christ. If they struggle to submit to Christ, they are not in the church, period. They can go to church, but they are not part of the church. We, we submit to him in worship. We respond to his love in worship. So every time you're getting on your knees, you are responding to what happened on Calvary, that you're meant to be eternally lost in a lake of fire. But because Jesus tasted death on your behalf, you have eternal life. That's the gospel, period. That's the gospel, and that's what you, you submit to. Similarly, if you love as Christ did, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. See, the problem is, it is easy to cheat yourself that you love your wife. And that's why you find some people say, she doesn't submit to me. But the thing is this, you don't love. But you keep thinking you love because from your checklist, you love. And that's why we keep, Master will tell you every time ahead time, and I don't think we have that time, Jeremy, today. I would keep men and women in two groups. And I would ask women what is love, and I would ask men what is respect. And I would get the men in the house very shocked by the list of what women mean by love. If you can love your wife according to her definition of love, you'll be surprised by how much she will naturally submit to you everywhere. She doesn't need any lecture to submit. It's a natural response to love. Now, we have a, we, we've all come across these love languages. And there are some ladies whose love language means you speak sweet words to them. Others want you to spend time with them. Others want, as you walk through the kitchen, you touch their bum bum. Others want service, make the bed, cook the dinner. That's how they feel loved. Others here, especially from Kiabu, yeah. <laughs> they respond to gifts. If you buy them a nice car, a nice watch, they feel loved. You'll be surprised the same way men feel respected. There are some men, respect for them is speaking to them nicely in good tone. Some men, they want you to spend time with them. Some men, when you love them, when you are intimate with them, they feel respected. Some men, when you serve them good dinner, the house is clean, their clothes are ironed, they feel, when you serve them, they feel respected. And some men, actually, when you pay the rent, when you assist with the bills, they feel respected. Now, disclaimer, you all know this is not my original thought. The Five Love Languages was developed by Gary Chapman. And uh, I think, in my view, this was very deep thought. The only slight difference I have is this. In my view, these items are not independent. In my personal view, again, I say this is personal. I don't believe that there are women who are only touched by words and they don't like any time with them. They don't like being touched. They hate it when you wash the clothes and they feel very bad when you buy them a hard bag. I don't believe there is such. Maybe the percentages may differ of how we express love. But I think all of us, we are looking for small bits of each one of these things. But some things are more important to us than others. What's my message? Gentlemen, love your wife according to her definition of love. Ladies, submit to your husband according to his definition of respect. Figure out what he means by respect and respond accordingly. Now, when there's no leadership, there is abuse. And in my view, there are seven types of abuses that I have seen in families. There's what we call verbal abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, financial, social, and spiritual. Let me just repeat. When there is no leadership, abuse is inevitable. So some people start name calling. I was doing the couple just last week, Khalidi was talking to me. And uh, the husband, husband, 
calls her a gold digger, basically a prostitute. That's very serious verbal abuse. Emotional abuse, there are people who use silence as a weapon, not as a gift of patience, not as a gift of the Holy Spirit. They won't talk to you, and they are cold on you, and you're in the same house, but you don't connect anymore. Emotional abuse. Then there is physical abuse. That's physical assault, hitting someone. Sexual abuse could take many forms. It could be denying your partner or manipulating them, or even forcing yourself on your partner. Yes, there is domestic rape in marriage. Or even doing something against their consent. And then we have financial abuse. You may be the main breadwinner, but you refuse to do stuff. Knowing very well you're going to be kicked out of that house, or her car, or his car, will be claimed back by the money lenders. You refuse to pay school fees for the children to teach your partner a lesson. Financial abuse. Financial manipulation. Social abuse. I have seen couples who won't allow their partner to talk to their sister, to their mom. They won't allow them to go for coffee date with anybody else. They block them from socializing with other people. They have no life outside that house. And finally, there is spiritual abuse. We have people who can't allow you to go to church or to read scriptures or to pray to connect with God. And uh, where there is no leadership, you fight people abusing each other. My challenge to men get back to the driving, to the steering wheel. Because you are driving along the interstate. The lowest speed is 70 miles an hour. And if your wife realizes there's nobody on the driver's seat, the most natural thing to avoid a head-on collision is to jump onto the driver's seat. That's the most natural thing women do. If they realize there's a vacuum in leadership, what do I mean? Nobody's checking the child's homework, they will check. Nobody's paying the rent, they will go out of their way and pay. That means they might work overnight and then there is no sex for you. Because eventually they have to do more hours. The point is, she will not come back home and tell you, now I am the leader from today. She just steps forward and starts driving the vehicle. It looks okay for a couple of weeks months, three years later, you are a zombie. You feel displaced, and you notice it. And then that's the time you call for me. That's when people call me, oh, she's so controlling. <laughs> he never realized all through when he was losing the steering wheel. <laughs> when he has totally lost control, it's when he has agreed finally to see a counselor. Gentlemen, get back to the steering wheel. If you stop driving this vehicle, she will get there and start driving it. It won't take long before every neighbor, before your relatives, before your friends notice it. It doesn't take long for everybody to realize you no longer drive that vehicle at home. You look weird. You look funny. You are only in men's clothes. Let's not say more than that. <laughs> How is leadership in marriage relevant to seagulls in the house? I don't know whether there are seagulls in the house. Any seagulls? Because I don't ignore them. We have one, two, okay. So I'll not go to any details, but for their sake, and because the two who lifted up their hands, they are ladies, this is my message for you. When you're dating, simple rule, if a man can't safely take you out of the car park, what makes you trust him to drive you along the interstate? If he cannot propose to you, what makes you trust him in marriage? You know, I'm very shocked these days. Women are proposing to men. If he's unable to take that first step of proposing, what makes you think he can make other decisions in that home? Never blame him. Blame yourself. You got yourself into a driverless vehicle from the word go. Songs chapter 2, verse 7. Solomon said, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the doors of the field. Stand not, nor awake his love, until he pleases. My message to the girls in the house, don't try to propose to that guy. Let a man lead. If he cannot propose to you, he might be a leader, but not your standard. He's fearing you. Let him lead his class. Because maybe the only person he can lead is a house girl. He can propose to them. 
Sorry, I have respect for all careers. But I do believe some people are trying what they can't handle. Let him go and lead what he can. He, he can handle. Uh, to the ladies in the house, how is leadership in marriage relevant to you? My message to you as ladies, allow your man to lead. If you realize there is a leadership vacuum, before you start driving that vehicle, get help. Because the moment you start driving it, before long, there will be a crisis in that home. You know, he will eventually feel irrelevant, feel insulted, assaulted, and he'll start attacking you. I can tell you, almost one out of one, when a woman starts leading a family, it doesn't take long before they're in a very serious crisis and a very severe fight. So it may look good for a while that you're doing it, but don't do it. I beseech you in God's name. If you realize he's not doing well in his career life, he's affected in his esteem, you would rather now talk with him slowly by slowly. Don't expect overnight miracles. And figure out whether you can help him invest in business and pursue a business line. Because some men are very frustrated by their employers. And eventually his self-esteem is going lower and lower and lower. But the same guy can partner with Maridadi here and be exporting vehicles to Nigeria or to Cameroon or anything else. You could open for a pharmacy for him. Somehow, this is something you need to sit down and say, honey, we need to talk. Because the longer you drive that vehicle, the bigger the problem accumulates. I have seen it. I've dealt with many marriages, as I told you. Eventually, it doesn't add up well. Number two, sex in marriage. Now, this is sensitive because, first of all, we come from a culture where we don't, Africans, we don't talk sex. We just do it. We do it. We are very active. We don't talk about it. We are just men and women of action. Even, can you believe this? Even my own wife sometimes gets very shocked with the things I write on Facebook. But I told her today, we were talking today, and I told her I also get very shocked. Because sometimes I listen to my own videos and I'm shocked. How can somebody talk such things? I also get shocked. So you're not alone. I also, I listen to some of these videos that I can't even listen to the ad. I feel like shutting it. So sometimes I think, God just wants us to speak these things for the sake of the church. Here's the deal. I think we have taken sex as a side issue. And, and I'm not saying this because I have Moranga friends like Peter. But Moranga is a crisis. And uh, what were Moranga? They are very good in providing money. Wanafanyaga kazi sana. At least watu wanyeri, among the kikuyus, watu wanyeri wako afadhali. People from Western Kenya, on a serious note, they are very good in this. They are very good. Kiabu, you are not as affected as Muranga. Muranga is money, money, money. Western Kenya, a lot of men know how to handle girls. I don't know about Kirinyaga. Purity, how do we do? How do we perform? I, I'm, I'm born in Kirinyaga, my two parents. How do we perform? We are okay. <laughs> So anyway, this is not a topic we talk about a lot. We think this is a side issue. I want you to know from today, and that's what I want to show you from scriptures. This is not a side issue. Almost the make or break of any marriage depends on this. Now, and I'll show you in scriptures. First, of course, there could be many reasons for marriage. Let me give number two. Number two, in my view, is companionship. Number three, support. You know, paying bills together, raising kids together. Number four could be the issue of getting children. Yes, God wanted children to be raised in marriages, Malachi 2, 16 and following. But the number one reason for marriage, and many believers don't know this, was actually sexual intimacy. Let me go back to the other reasons. Number two, companionship. Do you know you still can get good company from your brother, from your sister, from your mother, and from your dad? You can get good company from your friends. Does that make sense? As a matter of fact, some women here, they enjoy the company of other ladies than their own husband. And even some men. There are some men who are happier in a nightclub than when they're with their wife. Is that a fact? Can we just be real? Yes. They connect more. So you still can get company from others. The third reason is support. But the fact is, 
you and your sister, you and your brother, you still can pay those bills and support each other. The fourth reason could be raising children. You still can adopt kids. I have two or three friends. One of them is a senior pastor. And uh, they didn't get their biological children, but they adopted kids. The primary reason is literally sexual intimacy. So because we take it for granted, our marriages end up being very mechanical. Because we take this thing as one of the items in marriage. And now today, if I don't convince you anything else, I want to convince you this is not one of the issues. This is the core issue that you should be asking yourself, what time am I finishing so that you go and do? <laughs> now, I'll look at five questions. And by the way, <laughs> let, uh, okay, <laughs> let me look at five questions. Number one, can I, these are the five questions I want us to answer together. One, can a couple be happily married without sex? Two, when should couples engage in sex? Three, who should initiate sex in marriage? Four, how often should couples engage in sex? And number five, how do we avoid extramarital affairs? Okay, question number one. And by the way, the single ladies in the house, you'll be happy you attended this. It's, it's 18 plus, and you are. Now, I have a question here. Before you answer this question, I want to make two disclaimers. And then I'm going to be asking you to answer this question. The two disclaimers are this. I'm assuming none of you is sick. And I'm assuming you're both sleeping in the same house. One person is not in Birmingham and the other one in Nairobi. You're both in the same house. None of you is sick. My question is this. Can a couple be happily married without sex? How many are saying yes? All right. How many are saying no? From the depth of your heart. Okay. At least here we are on the same page. The answer is definitely no. The answer is definitely no. Now, Sex is the primary objective of marriage. Let's go to scriptures. Jesus said, haven't you read? He was replying to the Pharisees. That at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. One man, one woman. Not one man, three women. Not two men. You know, there are some pastors in America who are officiating two men. That's a curse. He made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother because that's the biggest problem in marriage. The man's ability to leave his parents. That's the biggest problem in marriage. Not the woman, the man. If your husband is still consulting his father or mother or both, you need a counselor very fast. Honoring your parents does not include consulting them. There's a difference between children obey their parents. That's a command for children. For adults like you, it's to honor. And in the Old Testament, it literally meant sending them financial support. Literally. That's what it meant. A man will leave his father and mother, that's the first step towards marriage, and be united to his wife, and the two will do sex. That's what it says, because most of you don't read it properly. <laughs> they will become one flesh, not one spirit. Not one in mind. It is one flesh entering another flesh. That is what Jesus was saying. That's the only time you become one flesh. Right now you are not one flesh. Yeah, it is one flesh. You are now you are two flesh. This was the beginning of creation. Let's, let's look at it further. The very first command God gave man was sex. And we don't realize it. The commandment not to eat the fruit we read earlier is in Genesis chapter 2. But in Genesis 1.26, the word man is mentioned for the first time. Let us make man in our own image. And verse 28 of chapter 1, God gave man the command for the first time. And the commandment was, be fruitful. Of course, sometimes we use this scripture to teach about purpose, potential, making it in life. But we know the truth. God was saying, when I come back, I want to fight some babies. How do I know that is what God meant? Because you need to go back to Genesis 1.22. He told the whales the same things. Be fruitful and multiply. Not fulfill your another destiny. Uh -uh. When I come back, I fight the ocean full. That's what he was saying. 
He said, fill the earth. And I have no issue with using this for potential, for purpose, and all the other gymnastics we do. But the actual thing that Jesus, God said is that he wants to find other babies. That's the actual thing. The other things are things we expand. You know, we expand scriptures. But the actual thing God said, when I come back, I find babies. So basically, what commandment did he give Adam? Mwanze kufanya maneno sahi. Nisi wakute mkiwa wawiri tena. That was the first commandment. The Apostle Paul does not give any other reason for marriage except sex. This is very interesting. Let's look at what he says. First Corinthians 7, I picked a couple of scriptures. And the, Paul knew about marriage. He wrote about marriage than anyone else in the New Testament. And he could have given the reason for marriage like companionship, support, getting children. But the only reason he repeated in scriptures was actually sexual intimacy. Now, if you don't like my version and IV, bring your version we read. We can read any version. Paul says, now to the singles, I say this. It is good for them to stay single as I am, in simple language. But if they cannot control themselves, if they cannot control themselves sexually, this is the only reason he is giving them for marriage. He is saying, it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It's better to marry than to buy sex toys. It is better to marry in today's language than to masturbate. Can we call a spade a spade? That's what he's saying. You better get married because the fact that you're masturbating means you have a certain need. Why can't you just marry? And he's saying marriage is a choice. He's not saying pray over it. Yeah, this is a choice you have to make. Verse 36, if anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably, why? The same things I said. They are doing other things that are not in line with how God intended you to enjoy sexual pleasure. God wanted you to enjoy man and woman, not yourself alone. If you're enjoying it alone, that's what Paul is saying. You are not doing it honorably. Or you're meeting other guys there and you're overpetting. You are not greeting the way Jeremy told us to greet each other here. He demonstrated the holy greeting. He stopped the brothers who are going beyond. <laughs> now, if you're not acting honorably, and if his passions are too strong, and if you see ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He's not sinning. They should get married. What is saying? Get married. Stop burning with passion because there's no single thing that is adding in your heavenly account. Hapa ukijipima, hakuna point in ogeza biguni. You, are, you just get married. There's no credit you're getting for staying single. Basically, the point he's saying, the reason he gave for marriage was literally, if you're able to stay alone, you'd rather, in fact, if there is no sex, don't try marriage, because marriage has very many problems to solve. If you're not interested with sex, you are, you are, your sanity is better alone. Yeah. Once you get married, you have too many problems to solve. Mtakosana, mkosane. That's what Paul was saying. Those who get married in this life have many troubles. That's what Paul said. So if you do not have an issue with your sexual passions, you'd rather stay single. That's what he's saying. When should couples engage in sex? Again, I want you to be honest here. One, when the woman wants. Two, when the man wants. Three, when both are ready. Four, when either wants. Okay, let me try. By a show of hand, when the man feels like. Okay, hats down. When the woman feels like. Okay, hats down. When both are ready. Very many hats. When either of them wants. 50-50. 50-50. My conviction, when either wants. Not when both want. Not when both are ready. Now, again, what I'm teaching here today is based on scripture. So let's read the Bible. Let's read the Bible. Because a lot of people, some of you believe this when either wants, but they don't practice it. And some of you genuinely believe both of us must be ready. If you believe you must be both ready, please hear me because that's not scripture. The scripture doesn't say when you're both ready. 
Can we read together? The husband should fulfill his marital duty. What is it? Duty. A duty means, how many here go to work because, when they feel like? When you don't feel like, you don't report. How many? Your work, yeah. How, when you don't feel like going, you don't go. How many know you go to work by purpose, not by feeling? Does that make sense? Yes. Pastor Jacob, whether you feel like preaching or not tomorrow, you are preaching. <laughs> you don't preach by feeling. You have a duty to fulfill. Do you agree with me, guys? Yes. There are, times, are there times you don't feel like working? Yet you have to? To work. And by the way, I'm not talking about those who are employed, even those who are in business. Business, actually, when you get into your own business, you need more discipline. You need more discipline or you will fail. So the thing is this, we don't work by feelings, we work by purpose. Paul is saying, when it comes to sex, this, is, this scripture is all about sex, by the way. It is not when you feel like, it's a duty to fulfill. Fulfill that duty to your wife. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Verse 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. What's your name again, darling? Yeah? Anne. Anne. Yeah. And your husband? And your husband? Muiruri. Ah, please come. You're such a nice couple. Especially the Yeah. Anne. Yeah. You're just the victim because you're the nearest person to me. Akiwa anataka leo, na hujisiki, lazima utake. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This a good... That's the Bible. Yeah. That's the Bible. Ah, niseme kwa Kiswahili. Huu mwili ni wa muiruri. Look, look. That's the Bible. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it. Yields. Kujipea na kujiachilia. You said to her husband, in the same way, Moirole, whom we see Wako, you are Anne. I will always yield. You will always yield. I love that. All the time. So, if you are a anataka, na you are a mother, you are a mother. This is a very nice couple. Very nice. You know why the Bible is talking about the body? Because you live in this body. This is not you. No. You, you live in this body. Who ni mwili? Msinganganie mwili, mpatie. That's what it is saying. Yes. Number five. Msinyimane. Unless you agree. Tunachukua siku bili, ama masamane. You have to agree the time. The only time you can't have sex is by mutual consent. And for a time. You must define the time. Even if it's prayer and fasting. Because you can pray and fast and still be tempted by Satan because of lack of self-control. You can go for prayer and fasting and still fornicate. That's what the word of God is saying. Even if you go for prayer and fasting, by the way, if you choose to fast, it's okay, go ahead and fast, lakini badu atakufanya. Nothing. Unless you agree. Unless. Unless you both agree. Sex was part of the items you are fasting. How, you know what we are saying here. As a couple, you can agree to fast, breakfast only, correct? Or lunch only. You can even agree to fast meat only. Daniel fasted for 21 days and he was actually eating. He was eating and drinking. He was eating vegetables, drinking water. The only thing he did not eat was meat. And it was a fasting acceptable to God. So you can decide to fast, including fasting sex. But if you have not agreed that it's an item, you go fast. Lakini mwiri upatiane. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> Anything else may not make sense. But that but one that does. Make sense. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing is this the one advantage we have over many people, we have a source of authority. So when we are teaching matters of families and marriage and things like parenting, we have a source of authority. 
studying here, I come on here as a facilitator. The one teaching us is the Holy Spirit. If you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, this will bring healing to our families. Because it's very sad to keep on talking about strong marriage foundations. But we don't ask ourselves, what are these foundations? Now, who should initiate sex in marriage? Again, I want to ask you a very simple question. I want you to be honest. Should it be the man? Should it be the woman? Should it be either? Okay, hats up. Man. All right, hats down. Woman. Okay, hats down. Either. I know it sounds popular, but the answer is man. I'll explain. I'm, I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. Yeah, I know. I know what is logical sounds like either. Now, this is tricky. Sex should be when either wants. But usually, or what you call the normal practice is the man always reaching out to the girl. Why? As a gentleman, you should know this. The moment you don't reach out to your woman, she eventually doesn't feel appreciated. She doesn't feel loved. And the average woman, if you don't reach out to her many, many days, many months, she feels rejected, unwanted. She begins to doubt her beauty. She starts thinking she's not attractive to you. So that's why as a leader, she can start anytime she wants. So when the girl wants, that's okay, anytime. But you should not be waiting for her to start. No. You should be very quick to start because it doesn't cost you anything as a man. But for the girl, if she continues doing that, she feels like she's not attractive and she's forcing herself to you. That's what she feels. But for you as a man, when you start, it's the natural. It is a natural. You should remain the hunter throughout your marriage. Now, what is initiating sex? I know most of you believe I'm talking about at night. I start sex in the morning. How? I send a text to Mercy. I'm not talking of those. I'm not going to say more again. I'm not talking about those Meru texts. Ukwapi. Unakuja sagapi. I'm not talking about those type of texts. I'm talking about a text telling her, darling, last night was hot. Oh my God. I'm talking of a text to prepare her for the evening. I'm saying this, Pastor, because you are a man of God and nobody will ever tell you this. Intimacy starts when you wake up. You prepare her for 24 hours and the cycle continues. That text, ya kujua amefika wapi, that is not the text I'm talking about. <laughs> then when she comes home, start touching her. Muirole, I think this one you do well. I don't think Muirole needs encouragement. <laughs> it is touching anywhere. Yesterday, the last two days, our son Zig was in Savannah. They were having a very major game. He's in soccer. And uh, this was very major. It was for the whole state of Georgia. And our daughter is in the university. So we are left with mercy. So sometimes when we are just the two of us, you will find us doing a lot of things we don't do when they are there. So we might be in the kitchen with very, very, very few clothes. <laughs> yeah? And we are not necessarily having sex. No, 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 no. It is what I'm calling about the preparations. The whole day, the whole mood is very, very, it's cloud nine. Yeah. Heating the bats. Yeah, you look like what I'm talking about. Brother, give me a high five. He, who, he, this is what is salvation. Who do you walk over? Yeah. Yeah. Surprise her. Yeah. If, if you have not gone out the two of you for so long, surprise her. Book a cabin. It doesn't have to be an expensive holiday. Just to send a signal. I keep thinking about our love life, not just about our bills. We end up becoming two wheels of a mechanical thing, you know. And finally, there's, there's something that brought you two together. When you first met, you were not thinking about the bills. When you first met, love brought you together. 
And to sustain it, you have to be intentional, you have to be deliberate. Love is not a feeling. Love produces feelings, but it's not a feeling. Love is intentional. Love is a commitment. You can love whoever you choose. We can meet with you today, and we have never met before. If you purpose and I purpose, both of us, we can be friends for life after this meeting. It's a decision you make who to share your love. God loved us deliberately, intentionally, when we were dirty, lost in our sins. For God so loved the saints that he gave his only begotten son. Is there such a scripture? No, there is not such a scripture. For God loved the saints that he gave his only begotten son. Is there such a scripture? For God loved the? What does the word mean? Sinners. It's not this planet. It means sinners. What does that mean? He loved us as we? Wow. And that's what love means. It's a decision to love someone who is filthy. That's what John 3.16 is saying. He loved the unlover boss. Love is a decision. It produces feelings, but it's not a feeling. It's a decision to do the things we have discussed. To sacrifice, to take initiative, and to influence. To, 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 to lead from the front. Anyway, how often should couples engage in sex? Are you tired, guys? No. Okay. Now, this is a tricky question because you're going to give me politics. I want numbers. Give me numbers. Don't give me politics. Give me numbers, whether it's numbers in a month or numbers in a week or numbers in a day. Every day. No, I'm not asking nice a joke. You know Jeremy is an MC. I'm asking honestly what you honestly believe. Let me, let me hear a couple of figures. What you honestly believe. Yes, go on now. Every day. Anybody else? Yeah? Three, four times a week. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. I agree. Look. I agree with you. I agree. Can we say this? Can we say this? He, what he's saying is true. Age is a factor. Health is a factor. There are many factors. So I'm asking, that's true. I'm asking for your family. The reason I'm asking this question, I want to help you for that girl to implement. How many times would you want? Let me go further. Before you, yeah. you expand it. Yeah. You see, it's like talking to a youth yeah. or youthful people. Yeah. I agree. 50, yeah. You cannot say every day sex. Correct. <laughs> yes, I agree. We agree with you. We are with you 100%. Some people said do twice or three times in a week. Yeah. It's not about age. Yeah. But when you are going to the age of 40, 50, yeah. you cannot try it. You are... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think we agree with him. We agree with him. The only question I'm asking, no, by the way, everybody agrees with you. What you're asking for your marriage, how many times would you want? I, I'm trying to ask you for your marriage. Don't generalize. Uh, not sure about the, the frequency, but maybe going back to what we said. Yeah. When I, I agree totally. Yeah. Now I want us to be specific. You are in a couple of seminar. I want us to be vulnerable. I want your partner to hear. Daily. Give me a figure. Daily. Daily. Good. So let's come back to you. Give me a figure. Three times a week. Very good. And by the way, these numbers, as he was saying, and as he's saying, these numbers, there's nobody who's wrong. The only thing I want your partner to hear. Nataka kukutetea. That's all. If he comes for counseling, and he appears three times, I have a problem with you. Because he declared it very clearly. Openly. Jeremy, is she called Anne? Sally. To kitoka hapa. Yield the body to the owner. Yes. Dr. Ali, unataka kufanyo maragapi? Let, let him know. 
I'm coming to the couples. As many times as you feel like, like when you are yeah. with her and the kids on her bed. Yeah. You, she does laundry. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. He cooked tea another time. I think the point is home, correct? The point is home. I think the point is home. As often as uh, either once. Yeah. Which is the same thing, Pastor, you are saying. Yeah. The only thing, I think when we come back, Jeremy, we're going to talk more about these things quality, hygiene. I'll not touch them tonight. How do we avoid extramarital affairs? In the interest of time, I want to suggest four ways to avoid any rumor, you know, poor rights, that you should avoid any appearance of sin in your homes. Even an appearance, not just sin, appearance. So let me suggest four ways. One, again, this is going to be hard for many of us. This is my personal conviction. The first way to avoid extramarital affairs, let your partner know where you are with who at any given moment. I have lived by this principle, 21 years of marriage, and actually, even the four years we dated with Marcy before marriage, she used to know where I am. At any given moment, one time I wrote like that on FB and somebody said, Dr. Umelaliwa Chapo, ni kasema kabisa. Kabisa. I like it that way. Because for me, I'm, I'm happy when Mercy knows where I am. I don't see what's the issue. What's marriage for if you can't tell where your partner is? The thing is this. Life is measured in terms of time. Everything you do under the sun, one thing is consumed, time. So if your partner can tell where you are, then you are living in the light. Number two. I believe with all my heart, this is the most tricky for most couples. You don't have to do what I do. But for me and for my, my mercy, before we got married, we made an agreement very clearly. Because we have gone through tests like most of you. For example, before we were dead, Masi used to be the quality manager. We had just left college. Maraba tea factory in Limuru. And uh, as the quality QC manager, she would work until 9 in the evening. Now, I didn't know how Americans work. So with my Kenyan mind, I convinced Masse, our first year of marriage, I even opened for her the scriptures. It tells the husband to uh, make the wife happy. For how long? One year. <laughs> I read for her. And I told her, I think in my view, and she agreed with me, she actually resigned. Not for anything else, for the sake of us establishing a strong marriage foundation. It took her one year to get a job. But we felt like her coming home, leaving 9.30, coming home 10.30. This may not work, maybe in America. So, so you don't have to apply everything. But that's exactly what we did. That's exactly what we did. So I was providing single-heartedly for our first year of marriage. Then she got a job. And uh, the point is this. From the word go ahead, you can ask myself when I'm not here. Just verify whether some of these things I'm saying are true. I, would, I was making per day those days, not dollars, Kenya shillings, not dollars, Kenya shillings, 200, 300, I was earning like a house girl. In fact, one day, our little car, it used to be a gas toilet when I got married, then out of gas. Purity and Peter confirmed this from a guy called Christopher Kuru Kemani. He came to put fuel in my car, 200 shillings. Kuni rescue kwa barabara. Kwa barabara, yeah. Mafuta miyabiri si kuwanayo. So I used to earn 200, 300, because I was in export business. I used to speak in schools and all that. And um, I was not a known speaker. So the schools were not many. But the problem was not that. If I was not having this business I was trying, exporting vegetables in UK, the money I was making in schools, seriously, I was getting a couple of schools. They used to pay me those days 3K, not dollars, not dollars, Kenya shilling. But our house was 4,500 a month. So they only needed two schools to pay the rent. But I used to take this money to this business. And I was sinking deeper and deeper in debt. It took me seven years to get out of that hole. And I insisted. I kept on telling her this thing would be big. 
Because when I left college, I did things, if I look back, I should not have done. I went to hire a go down at the airport. I took decisions that were ahead of me by far. It was too costly for me to sustain. I was so broke. I was so broke because I had like three bank loans. And that's when I had just started my marriage. I would come home. Na hile ime baki ni miabiri ya kuoba. And we would budget it with mercy. We would go buy bananas together. My landlord used to be very upset with me because he would see me calling her show up to the stairs. We were living upstairs and I have not paid the rent. I had arrears for six months and he's asking me, na unabeba bibi tu? You know? Nimekunyo ju yako leo. You know? For sure he was. For sure he was. Anyway, what's my point? We started budgeting together that time. As time went by, things started changing. And at some point, God started blessing us. And there are times I would go, do a training. I know this may seem very exaggerated to Kenyans. There are times I would do a single training for between 500,000 and 1 million. I didn't say in a week, in a single day. In a single day. And let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I would, to date, I don't budget money in our house. To date, I don't. I don't. Mercy still does it. Because I started doing it when our marriage was young. That she can account everything. Because one, she's smarter than me. Two, she's better in financial management than me. You may not believe it, but I, I don't have any relationship with money. I can spend everything the same day. That's you. So I needed someone who is very sober. Money matters. And God sent me someone who can compliment me. But even if you don't believe in what I'm practicing in my marriage, I honestly think couples should budget their money together. Whatever works for you. Because some people say, you take care of the house, I'll take care of the projects, maybe you're putting up some real estate, that's okay. Whatever works for you. But let your partner know what you're doing with your money. That's the point. Because what is marriage for if you're not partnering in your area of finances? Jesus said... Where your treasure is, there your heart is. Throughout the scriptures, when God wanted to test people's hearts, he tested what they do with their money. Throughout scriptures. You may call Abraham a man of faith, but he was tested in the area of giving. Each one of them. It's in the area of your relationship with money. Of all things that Jesus could have said, compete with God. He only said one item. You cannot serve God Ed Mamo, the God of money, or money. Only one thing Jesus said can compete with God. He didn't even say the devil. Seriously, if you can overcome this area, you are free. Because why do we have false prophets if it's not for money? Why do we have con men? Why did Jeremy have to tell us that this brother is not a crook? We can invest in him. The lady who presented here He's telling us, if she steals your money from those houses, we hold him responsible. Check whether it's corruption, fraudsters, whether they are false prophets. All of them have one thing in common, the love of money. First Timothy 6.10, the love of money is the root of all evil. If you can conquer money, you are free, and free indeed. Completely free indeed. If you're listening to me, and you have secret bank accounts, that your partner does not know. I tell you, every single bridge you build, you're going to use it. There's no bridge that is built in vain. All plans B you have just in case this marriage does not work, I have this thing aside. You're already cursing your marriage. You don't have faith in your marriage. Number three, I honestly believe there should be no secrets about your phones or emails. Me and Marcy, you don't have to copy us. We use the same password for our emails and for our phones. And the question is this. If this person is removing all the clothes in your bedroom, why do you feel like seeing a message in your phone? She, he is infringing into your privacy. What privacy are you looking for? Why can't you be single and stick with your phone? You know, you can't choose marriage and choose privacy. Between the two of you, you are naked and not ashamed. That is, that is as far as God is concerned. And my conviction is, 
the moment you start having a problem, your partner seeing your phone, mm -hmm. and you start accusing now of being insecure, I challenge you today, it's you who is being insecure. Whoever is hiding the phone is the one who is insecure. Yeah. You know what? Not just mercy. Just go pick my phone. If you need to check anything in my phone, please just pick it. And number four, to avoid extramarital affairs. Now, the last one is very interesting. Let me show you from the Bible. Paul actually says, one way to avoid extramarital affairs, be intimate. 1 Corinthians 7, 2. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. Paul says one way to deter sexual immorality is by being intimate. Well, if somebody engages in extramarital affairs, definitely we agree here, there is no excuse whether there is sex at home or not. That I agree. There is no excuse. However, Paul is saying, if you continually deny each other, you have opened a doorway for sexual immorality in that family. You are making your partner vulnerable. Of course, sexlessness in marriage is also infidelity. It's as bad as extramarital affairs. But I'm also saying today, the moment you deny your partner, you are immediately telling your partner to open the doors from that house to another place. He is wrong, yes, but you're equally wrong. In fact, if your partner cheats on you because of sexlessness, don't think you're more holy than your partner. You are both equal sinners of infidelity. Sexlessness in marriage is infidelity. By law and by scriptures, a marriage can be dissolved because of sexlessness. I've shown you many scriptures showing clearly intimacy. It's not a side issue in marriage. It is a central component. It is central. God has a sense of humor. He even put the organs at the center. <laughs> How is sex in marriage relevant to seagulls? Now that you don't have many seagulls, I'll not get into details, but I'll tell these two girls this. 15th of December, 1998, is the day I proposed to Marcy at 7 p.m. That's the day I proposed to her. We got married 29th of March, 2003. No sex until we married. And those are the words I told her that December, 1998. I told her that on her eyes. And I tell you today before the Holy Spirit, I kept my word. Why am I saying this to the seagulls? Because sex is a decision. It's a decision. You are not mad. Hakuna wazimu. That if you don't do today, you will die. It's a decision. Self-control is a decision. We know it is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We know that. But the fact is, even those people who don't subscribe to the Bible, you agree with me. We have people who have never been in church. They don't even know Christ as Lord and Savior. And they follow moral principles. Is that a fact? That we have some people who could be Buddhists or Hindus, and they still follow moral principles. Morality is a human thing. It's not just Christianity. Even before Jesus died on the cross, adultery was adultery. Before the law was given to Moses, adultery was adultery. Does that make sense? Why? Now what I'm going to say may disturb the married. But I'll tell you this. A lot of couples today are firefighting and they don't trust each other simply because they engage in sex before marriage. So they met somebody who has slept with a couple of people and they're always doubting that person to this day. Many problems you see in marriage is simply because we don't hearken to God's instructions. I know that hurts some people who are married. But it's also important to know the foundation of where the rain began beating you. However, the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. The moment you repented those sins, God forgot those sins. The Bible says, and their sins, I'll remember them no more. Once you have repented those sins, God gives you a new start. But it's true. 
the moment you get into marriage with multiple sex partners, first, even from common sense, you start comparing your partner's performance with those other people. And you start doubting because you met this person, you slept casually without any commitment. So whenever this person is far away from you, you're always suspicious. So when you preserve sex for marriage, it's in your interest. The, and the devil is a liar. So before marriage, he tempts, he goes into sex. After marriage, he tempts the married out of sex in marriage and into extramarital affairs. He shows them they are dissatisfied with their partner. They should seek satisfaction elsewhere. And Paul says we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy. We should be aware of the schemes, the strategies of the enemy. So for you who are married, I'm saying this. To avoid giving the enemy a loophole in your marriage, be intimate as often as you would, more than you take communion. Because some churches have communion after a very long time. <laughs> now Jesus said, if you follow the communion rules of some churches as often as you would, your marriage will be dry. Here, the communion I'm discussing, I would rather go the Jeremy way, the daily, and the Muiruli way. What do I do if my marriage is sexless? Please, if you can now he gave us a sad story of the pilot who died, and I don't think I should be using this as an analogy. It was a very painful story. But in the event your car has a problem, and you are going to embark on a long distance, you'd rather fast fix it rather than continue driving. You'd rather fast fix it. And this is what I'll say. If your marriage is sexless, the fact that there is no war in that home, don't assume there is peace. Peace is not the absence of war. If the marriage is sexless, let me give you a very personal observation. I've never once found a couple that was engaging in sex that separated. Every time I have dealt with a couple that is divorcing, they first separated sexually before they separated literally. You'll never find a couple that is intimate, that is separating. No matter how you started your marriage, no matter how many problems you have dealt with, in-laws, communication, maybe even there was infidelity in your marriage at some point, you'll be surprised all these things will be healed when you become intimate. Your prayer life will be healed when you become intimate. The one thing the enemy wants to convince you, sex is dirty, sex should not be talked about. The moment you buy into that lie, you start opening a, le a leeway for the enemy to destroy your marriage. So if your marriage is sexless and you're unable to speak you to, please seek help. If you cannot afford counseling, you can look for a couple you, Muiruli, you can look for Muiruli. Look for a couple <laughs> that looks like they are excited about this thing. <laughs> and ask them, how do you guys do it? What goes on? It is true. You'll get free counseling from couples who are good at doing well in this area. We should be each other's keeper. You should be your brother's Keeper. Finally, communication. I'm tired. You're tired. We're all tired. So I take one or two minutes. We add. I pick your questions. And anyway, uh, Jeremy dealt with communication. He helped me. That's what he was dealing with. So I'll give you two points on communication, two slides, and I sit. What? That's the content. Why? The motive. When the venue, sorry, the time, where the venue, who the person. What I'm saying when you're talking to one another as a couple, then what you're saying, the actual words, the choice of words, the content matters. The why, the motive behind it matters. The when, the time, has he just lost the job and you're just insensitive or has she just lost her mother? Where? Are we discussing these issues at the shopping mall, embarrassing my partner in public, or in the presence of my kids to show them I'm the one who caused the shots here, or in the presence of an in-law? Who are you telling? This is your life partner. If you can talk so nicely to your boss and you can change jobs, if you talk so nicely to a waitress in a restaurant, you know what shocks me? People talk so nicely out there to a cab driver, to a waitress. And only at home they speak trash. 
I listen to how couples talk to each other. I'm shocked. Where did wisdom go? I would rather fight with a cop myself. I would rather fight with anybody else than speak bad words to Masse because I'm with Masse every day. I'm just thinking from a common sense perspective in my own interest, not even her interest. Forget about my love for her. If I love my peace, I think the first place that I need to make peace, apart from peace with God, number two should be peace with Masse. If I love myself. I thought this should be common sense. Seriously, we end up speaking so nicely to other people. I had a couple one day and the wife was totally convinced this guy must fight physically. He was hitting her physically. And I was counseling them. And I asked her, why do you believe he has to fight when he's ugly? Why do you believe that? They were together. So I asked them, so tell me, has this gentleman ever hit the mother? No. Are you saying he has never been annoyed by the mother? Are you saying this guy has never been annoyed by any cop? Especially Kenyan cops. And he has never beaten any of them. Are you saying this guy has never been annoyed by a customer? He's a businessman. And the only person he, he beats because he's annoyed is you and you have accepted. In fact, I was not blaming the guy. The woman has accepted it. That this guy, when he's angry, that's how he behaves. He behaves with who? Only with you. How silly did you become? People who fight should be jailed. Period. Because if you don't believe me, they control themselves everywhere else. I used to say in our church, we call it family church because I'm so passionate with the word family. And I would tell gentlemen, if you beat a woman and I get to know, before anything else, we'll be discussing when you're in jail. Because you have control. How many other people do you go hitting? Fighting is a choice. And it's a reflection of folly. Don't ever brag with anger. You know some people are very weird. They tell you, you know when I'm angry, eh? Kwetu to kikasirika. That's stupidity. What are you bragging about? There is a very thin line between foolishness and anger. Everybody gets angry. Don't make a mistake. Everybody gets. But the Bible says in your anger, do not sin. Don't hit your wife. Don't hit your husband. In your anger, don't break glasses. Don't break your phone. We were counseling a couple with Mercy one day. The woman picked the phone, crushed it. A brand new phone. Destroyed it. And I say, this is misbehaving. Don't think it's anger. <laughs> she, she knows what she's doing. She knows. And I told her very clearly, everybody gets angry. What matters is what you do with your anger. God gets angry. But the moment you start destroying things or hitting people, you should be arrested immediately because it's misbehaving. It's a choice. What you do in your anger is misbehaving. So the Bible continues saying, in your anger do not sin and do not let the sun go down. Why? It's a choice. God does not give a command that we cannot obey. It's a choice. But the most important thing in communication is the how, the tone, the tone. So I'll give an illustration and I'm done. Um, I think most of us have come across this. 7% of communication is the spoken word. And I believe this is true. That 8% is the tone and 55% is the body language, the facial expressions, how stable you are. It expresses love or hate. So, I give you one illustration and I close. The Native American Indian used to have a talking stick. So what they used to do, if they met in a baraza, the guys who were here originally, the American Indians, so when they were communicating sensitive issues, an elder would hold the talking stick and explain his point. When he felt understood, he would hand over the talking stick to the next elder. If he did not feel understood, he would hold the stick. It gave him the right to speak. And until he felt understood, he would not release the talking stick. When he felt understood, he would hand it over to the next person. We decided to try this with Mercy. Today we don't need a stick. We actually bought a box in Egypt, a blue box. 
And we said if we have a difficult conversation, can we try this concept? And we see whether it works. Because the older you get in marriage, for most people, not all of us, for most people, they improve on how they relate, they improve on how they communicate. I can tell you today, like any other family, we solve the same, same issues many other families have. The difference, and I know we are not alone. I know there are many other couples here like us. Where we have reached, I can say this with authority, is that we have reached a point where we cannot exchange words. That I'm able to stop speaking, listen to Mercy, she stops speaking and listen to me. If you are unable to do that as a couple, and you have a thorny issue, some of the thorny issues are maybe sex, maybe issues of money, maybe in-laws, maybe children. If you realize an issue is getting thorny, you can come up with a formula to ensure you listen to one another. So how it works is very simple. I'm holding this mic, and so long as I'm holding it, Muiruli, please come. He cannot speak. He's just listening. If I feel he understood what I said, I hand over to him. And I can't talk. It is his chance to talk. So for us, we bought a box to hold. And we were just trying it. The funny thing is, you miss it. The funny thing is this, we never had to use it with mercy. The person who used it was actually our daughter Ivy. Our daughter had us teaching this. And she actually one day felt misunderstood by me and the mother. And she went for the box. And she said, Dad and Mom, now you can't talk. I'm holding the talking box. And I realized we were actually not listening to her. But now that she had this box, we had no right to talk. And she wanted us to say exactly what she was saying until she feels understood. The point is this, you don't have to, but this worked for the American Indian. You come up with a way to ensure you listen to your partner until your partner knows they have been heard. Because if you can listen to one another, it does not matter the problem in that home. Whether there was infidelity in that marriage, you do not need a pastor, a counselor to reconcile the two of you if you are able to listen to each other. Every problem is solvable if you are able to listen to one another. If you cannot listen to one another, you have no difference with a dog, with a horse, with a monkey. What makes you different? Look at your whole body and look at a dog. What makes you different? If you cannot communicate, if you can't listen to one another, you are a spiritual being, you should be having higher faculties, but if you can't listen to each other, you are just like any other animal. Why is there a war between Ukraine and Russia? Simply because we can't listen to one another. Between Israel and Palestine. Believe you me, if they were listening to one another, a solution is possible. A solution is possible. Do you agree with me? It's possible. Even without dividing the country. In South Africa, people did not, I mean, nobody was kicked away like Zimbabwe. Nobody was, even in Kenya. Jomo Kenyatta did not kick anybody away, if you remember. Do you remember that? So it is possible for people to stay together and agree. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to invite Jeremy, and I have some books if you're interested. Let me mention one book. I didn't carry it, but you can get it online. Uh, the things I was teaching you today are from this book, Marriage Works. I, d I didn't come with copies. I came with other copies if you're interested, they're there. I've written many books, and uh, it's hard to carry all of them. I've done 19 books. But what I taught you today, I did in this little book. And let's be very frank. Some people are not good in reading. So you, if you're good in videos, there are free videos on YouTube. If you're good with online courses, the advantage is this. I know they look expensive here. I'll tell you this. You can get these courses at 10 bucks. At 10 bucks. I have no control over the platform. It's called Udemy. It's not my platform. So what I advise you do, if you find this expensive, you don't have to buy, you can wait. You can keep checking. Sometimes they give offers of even 10 bucks. This particular course is seven modules. And uh, you can do some projects as a couple. It's fun. It's video. It's uh, audiovisual. And uh, once you purchase, it's permanently yours for good. And as I said, you don't have to buy it when it's a bit pricey. You can wait. 
every two, three months they give an offer. And you can use it to teach many other people. Once you purchase it, you can share it with, I mean, other people can listen. They can follow the online course. I'm saying this because, truth be told, there are some people who are not very strong in reading books. But maybe if you sit down with them through such courses, 